HHS research has gained quite a bit of attention over the past 10 years. This next speaker has played a significant role in leading this increased interest in CCHS. The New England Journal of Medicine referred to his work in the regulation of respiratory drive as having the potential of undoing on dying. We are very lucky to have a researcher of this caliber in the CCHS community. I am honored to introduce Dr. Douglas Bayless. Dr. Bayless is the Joseph and Francis Lerner Professor of Pharmacology and Chairman of the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Virginia. Dr. Bayless received his PhD in physiology from the University of North Carolina and completed postdoctoral work in physiology and biophysics at the University of Washington. Dr. Bayless's research gets to the heart of the matter where CCHS is concerned by asking the basic question, what brain structures and mechanisms control breathing? In the course of his work, Dr. Bayless has established the importance of FOX2B expressing RTN neurons in respiratory drive, and he has developed a mechanism of how these neurons work to regulate breathing. Most recently, in landmark work supported in part by the CCHS Network Foundation and published in the journal Nature, Dr. Bayless has discovered shared molecular markers of functional significance in both CCHS and SIDS. Dr. Bayless will be sharing with us his research on how CO2 is sensed by FOX2B expressing RTN neurons and how this sensing leads to the control of breathing. Welcome, Dr. Bayless. Today, I'm gonna to be presenting some work that we've been doing on RTN respiratory chemoreceptor neurons uh, that we've been involved with for about the last 15 years or so. Um, and this is work that we've done together with our colleagues at UVA in the Patrice uh, DNA lab. And it also includes some um, uh, funding support from the uh, CCHS Family Foundation. So our, our interest in these cells is because RTN neurons uh, are critical for CO2 sensing and regulation of breathing. And we think that there's good reason uh, to suspect that these RTN neurons are, are involved at least in some aspects of the, um, of the human condition CCHS, um, although um, that evidence still remains uh, circumstantial. So first, I'll share a little bit of background about uh, RTN and RTN neurons. So as mentioned, RTN neurons provide a critical drive to breathe, so they uh, have inputs into the respiratory uh, pattern generator uh, to drive to drive breathing. And they also receive um, lots of inputs from other uh, cells and other uh, sensory input uh, related to breathing. Um, and this also includes um, input from uh, CO2. So um, CO2 uh, can directly activate RTN neurons, which I'll show you a little bit about uh, today and also uh, activates other cell, other cell types that can also uh, drive um, RTN neurons to drive breathing. So in the presentation today, I'll summarize some of our work showing that RTN neurons are critical um, ventral medullary CO2 or proton chemoreceptors that regulate breathing. I'll share a little bit about some of the intrinsic properties of these cells, including the molecular specializations that are important for CO2 or proton sensing in these neurons. And also share some new data on a neuropeptide system uh, that we think um, gets activated in RTN neurons at birth um, in order to support uh, breathing. So, uh, so why do we think these cells are important for uh, CO2 sensing and breathing? So this slide is going to summarize about 15 years of work um, in, in a number of different papers and it's been reviewed uh, multiple times, including um, by Patrice Guiné in this uh, TINS article here. So the RTN is localized here, um, just ventral uh, to the facial nucleus, as you can see in this uh, sagittal cartoon of a brainstem, and it projects to the, um, to the breathing uh, regulatory centers, the ventral respiratory uh, column. Uh, these cells were initially um, named uh, retrotrapezoid nucleus, 
uh, by virtue of their projections to those uh, respiratory centers. And at the time, it was actually suggested that they might be involved in CO2 uh, sensation, although there was no, um, no evidence for that other than their location here in an area that was historically um, thought to be involved in CO2 sensing for breathing regulation. So um, in this paper here, <clears throat> um, uh, Dr. Guillenet provided some of the first evidence that these cells were actually CO2 sensors. And so here are um, the data, uh, some data from, from that paper. And what you can see here is um, some recordings that Patrice did um, in the uh, RTN region, uh, extracellular uh, unit recordings of cell firing activity, which is shown down here. This, so this is neuronal firing activity. Um, and he increased uh, CO2 in these anesthetized rats while recording from these uh, neurons. And you can see that as the CO2 levels go up, so also did the uh, neuronal firing. And this preceded um, the activity in the phrenic nerve, which is uh, used as an indicator of respiratory output. Uh, the cells that he recorded were recorded as mentioned in this uh, area, which is uh, where these retrotrapezoid nucleus neurons are. So uh, the activity of these neurons did not depend on the, res on the respiratory system. So it was, these are upstream of the respiratory, uh, of the respiratory uh, pattern generator. Um, and um, in addition, uh, he also found that uh, these cells express a transcription factor called FOX2B. Uh, so he could label the neurons uh, that he was recording from here and show by immunostaining that they express this, uh, this transcription factor. And of course, this transcription factor is of interest to CCHS because that is the, the gene that's mutated in, uh, in CCHS. And CCHS is a syndrome that's characterized by disrupted uh, chemoreflexes and also a failure to arouse um, in uh, sleep when CO2 rises. So this was one of the first bits of evidence suggesting or correlating uh, these RTN neurons um, with the CCHS by virtue of the expression of this uh, transcription factor. So in a number of experiments, which I don't have time to show here, uh, the ENA lab has used optogenetic modulation of these uh, FOX2B positive RTN neurons to show that they can, um, that they have uh, major effects on breathing and arousal. So stimulating these neurons drives breathing and drives arousal and inhibiting these neurons inhibits breathing and inhibits arousal. And in fact, during slow wave sleep, if you inhibit these neurons, um, there's a, uh, the animal will completely stop breathing while the stimulation is taking place. So they're very important for, provide a very important drive for uh, breathing. <clears throat> so um, in our lab, we were interested in what the, whether these, uh, the CO2 sensation was an intrinsic property of these neurons. And so we made, uh, mice that um, in which the green fluorescent protein was driven downstream of a FOX2B promoter. Um, and you can see here these, this collection of RTN neurons in the area of the, um, just below the, the facial nucleus where they're supposed to be. And when we dissociate these neurons and then study them electrophysiologically, we can see that the firing rate of the cells depends on extracellular pH. So there's low firing rate at high pH and then uh, um, a higher firing rate as pH is lowered, or uh, alternatively, as CO2 is elevated. So these are uh, CO2 pH sensing neurons, and that, uh, that sensation, that sensing uh, ability is an intrinsic property of the cells. <clears throat> so um, we also uh, can uh, lean on some of the data of, of uh, colleagues um, in France, who've done some very interesting um, experiments to more, even more closely relate these RTN neurons to CCHS. And I'll just show you a couple um, examples from their work here. So <clears throat> this is from the Jean-Francois Brunet and Christophe Coridis. So these experiments, they uh, made mice in which they knocked into the FOX2B locus of the mouse uh, a mutation that is uh, one, of the one of the common mutations that's seen in CCHS patients, that is uh, uh, seven alanine repeat expansion um, in the FOX2B gene. And so uh, when they did this in these mice, uh, they saw that many of the, the pups that had, um, that had incorporated the mutation 
uh, were cyanotic and, and died at, at birth. And so you could practically genotype these mice uh, by virtue of whether or not they turned blue uh, at the time of birth. So this was very uh, reminiscent <clears throat> of the breathing issues that were uh, they're seen in CCHS patients when they incorporate the CCH mutation into these mice. Uh, more um, a detailed examination of these mice uh, by using um, plethysmography approaches, uh, could you, they were able to show that by comparison to wild type mice here, uh, the knock-in mice had a much uh, reduced uh, um, increase in breathing in response to CO2, and also a highly irregular breathing with many periods, uh, uh, apneic periods where the animals just uh, stop breathing altogether. And this is an example here of the normal uh, effect of CO2 on breathing in wild type mice. And you can see a very blunted uh, breathing in these uh, knockout mice. So this was a nice re recapitulation of the human condition, at least in terms of breathing, uh, CO2 sensitive breathing and apneas um, in these mice that have this uh, human mutation. Um, but does it have anything to do with RTN neurons? Well, so they had um, they they did some histology, and what they found was that these um, RTN neurons were severely depleted in the um, in the mutant animals. And so this is a, a section taken from a wild type mouse and from one of the knock in mice uh, in this region that I showed you earlier, where the RTN neurons are. And so the RTN neurons are normally here, expressing uh, FOX2B and BGLU2, and you can see in the mutant mouse. This, uh, this area is totally devoid of these cells. So um, the, the um, knock-in mutation seems to uh, specifically eliminate uh, these RTN neurons as it causes this um, radi radically reduced um, response to CO2. And other respiratory areas that they looked at uh, were uh, normal in these mice. So this provides some of that correlative um, data that I mentioned earlier, uh, suggesting these RTN neurons are very important for uh, the CO2 regulation, and may um, and that there may be a problem in these uh, with these neurons in uh, CCHS uh, patients. Okay, so um, the interest we had was in uh, understanding how these. RTN neurons sense uh, CO2. So how do they encode um, CO2 or pH? And <clears throat> so uh, four hypotheses have been advanced uh, to explain this. One is that the cells are intrinsically sensitive to CO2 or pH. Another is that there's um, indirect um, regulation of the RTN neurons by local astrocytes. So the astrocytes themselves are the pH sensors, and then they drive uh, RTN neurons by virtue of some paracrine signaling, um, specifically purinergic signaling. Uh, <clears throat> another possibility, as mentioned earlier also, is that there are other neurons that themselves are CO2 sensors, and those provide an input to drive the RTN neurons. And finally, some changes, uh, CO2-dependent changes in, um, in perfu local perfusion that alters the local pH uh, and, and thereby uh, modulates RTN neuron um, activity. And so what I want to focus on here is uh, mechanisms of intrinsic chemosensitivity. That is, um, can we identify the proton receptors in the RTN neurons uh, that are responsible for their CO2 or pH sensitivity? And I'm just going to uh, summarize here the, the answer to that question um, and then show you a little bit of data. So <clears throat> we actually found um, two different uh, CO2 or proton detectors in these um, RTN neurons. One is a G protein coupled receptor called GPR4, which is activated uh, by uh, protons. And the other is a background potassium channel uh, called uh, TAS2, and that channel is inhibited by protons. So GPR4 was identified as a proton activated G protein coupled receptor by Ludwig et al. back in 2003. And you can see an example of um, its uh, pH sensitivity uh, when expressed in a heterologous expression system here. As you decrease pH, you can see an increase in cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP production. And this increase in cyclic AMP production occurs over a physiological pH range. <clears throat> 
So in our experiments, we found that GPR4 can inhibit a background potassium channel in these neurons to increase uh, cellular excitability. Uh, TAS2 <clears throat> is a proton uh, inhibited background potassium channel. Um, and it's uh, the mechanisms for this uh, proton inhibition have been identified recently um, in, this, uh, in this nature paper. Um, and um, what you can see here is that uh, measuring uh, potassium currents from a cell uh, that's um, uh, heterologously expressing TAS2 is that um, when pH is changed, for example, here from 7.5 to 7.0, across the physiological range, you get a sharp decrease in potassium channel activity and a decrease in potassium current translates to an increase in cellular excitability. So those are the cellular mechanisms by which these two uh, independent um, pH detectors can regulate cell excitability. So um, does this matter for um, breathing control by the RTN? So um, this uh, picture here is from RNA scope in C2 hybridization, just showing that in FOX2B expressing uh, neurons in the RTN, there's expression of both TAS2 and GPR4. And these um, molecular detectors are found in overlapping groups of, uh, of RTN neurons um, in about 80 to 90% of the cells. And if we delete either GPR4 or TAS2, what we see is a, is a is a decrease in the pH sensitivity of the cell. So um, in a wild type mice here for TAS2 or GPR4, you can see that almost all of the cells are pH sensitive. Whereas a deletion of TAS2 or deletion of GPR4 causes an increase in the percentage of cells that fail to respond to changes in pH. That is, they become pH insensitive after deleting TAS2 or GPR4. Um, more importantly, some in vivo experiments. So when we put these knockout mice in a mouse plethysmograph and measure the change in ventilation as a function of increasing uh, concentrations of CO2 in the inspired air, you can see that by comparison to these uh, control groups, littermate control groups that are wild type at the GPR4 and TAS2 locus, uh, that elimination of either TAS2 or GPR4 results in about a 60% reduction in the CO2 uh, stimulated breathing. And elimination of both GPR4 and TAS2 causes basically an, a total elimination of CO2 stimulated breathing. So this suggests a, a major role for these two molecular detectors in uh, these RTN neurons. So <clears throat> as uh, as a, another um, important um, experiment, our colleagues uh, in the ENA lab, George Souza, uh, did experiments where he um, lesioned RTN neurons in the rat. It, these are chemotoxic lesions. Uh, and when he did a large lesion, greater than around 90% of the cells were eliminated, you can see that um, there's a, also a pretty complete elimination of the CO2 uh, stimulated uh, breathing in those, um, in those rats. And this looks very similar to what we see in our double knockouts of TAS2 and GPR4. So we interpret these results um, as follows. So first, um, that because uh, this lesion of RTN neurons practically eliminates CO2 sensitivity, it suggests that any of these other mechanisms um, that had been hypothesized must re rely on RTN neurons, at least in part, for their effects. So uh, this is all converging on these RTN neurons. And secondly, because this um, effect of these lesions seems to be recapitulated very nicely by elimination of either TAS2, or G uh, TAS2 and GPR4, it seems that this intrinsic chemosensitivity may actually be the preeminent um, mechanism for uh, driving CO2 regulated um, breathing. OK, so um, these, these neurons actually um, that we record from, we find that they have this um, stereotypic uh, pattern of behavior where they have uh, sort of this um, pacemaker-like activity um, that can be increased uh, when you uh, change CO2 or pH. Um, but something is driving this uh, pacemaker-like activity in these neurons, and we became very interested in, in what 
um, and what the uh, the cellular and ionic mechanisms were for this um, stable um, uh, and pacemaker-like activity in these cells. So I don't have time to go through all the data, but what we found was that there's a leak sodium channel that's expressed in, the, in these neurons that um, is required for their, for their cell excitability and also for their modulation by uh, substance P via uh, an NK1 receptor. So, so responsible for both ongoing activity and also modulated activity. In addition, we found that a uh, TRIP channel called TRIP-M4 underlies a, um, a calcium sensitive non-selective current um, that is important for um, driving a subthreshold oscillation uh, that's necessary for this uh, tonic activity. So both of these, um, both of these channels uh, were also required for um, CO2 responses because they were uh, necessary for increasing the cell activity. So um, decreasing the behavior of either NALCN channels or TRIP-M4 channels uh, decreasing their activity also decreased the cellular activity and the response to uh, CO2 and, uh, and or protons. And in both cases, when we uh, knocked down um, NALCN or we uh, pharmacologically inhibited TRIP-M4, we saw that breathing um, effects were decreased. So we think that these intrinsic neuronal properties, this depolarizing leak sodium current um, and the uh, TRIP-M4 um, sensitive uh, membrane potential oscillations uh, are important for pacemaking in the RTN neurons as they are in other CNS type uh, pacemaker neurons. And uh, that this uh, provides a safety factor for the tonic activity that's needed uh, to drive respiratory activity um, under various uh, physiological conditions. So uh, these are just a few of the um, cellular uh, and ionic mechanisms that, that we've looked at. But I want to emphasize that the RTN neurons themselves are modulated by many, many other uh, kinds of inputs. So I mentioned the blood uh, changes in blood flow and effects of local um, astrocytes, but they're also um, uh, receive inputs from various um, other modulatory neurotransmitter systems. So for example, cholinergic inputs via muscarinic receptors will activate these cells serotonin via ser ser serotonergic uh, receptors like the 5-HT2 and 5-HT7 receptors have been implicated. Uh, alpha-1 adrenergic receptors can drive these cells as well as various uh, peptidergic inputs, for example, um, orexin inputs um, here uh, from the lateral hypothalamus that are associated with arousal. So these are well-modulated uh, uh, neurons um, that are important for um, and, and this is likely important for things like arousal dependent uh, regulation of breathing. And all of these inputs are superimposed on the intrinsic properties and that CO2 sensitivity that I uh, described earlier. Okay, so um, just to change gears a little bit, um, we wanted to know more about what, was, um, what properties these cells have. Uh, and one way to uh, look at this was to uh, try to identify some of the genes that are expressed in these cells and what might be unique about, about, these, about these neurons. And so uh, to, to um, take this on, uh, Dr. Shi in the lab uh, did some um, RNA-seq from RTN neurons uh, that, she, uh, that she harvested from cells, uh, um, in, in cells from the, um, those FOX2B GFP mice that I mentioned earlier. And so when she did this and did the RNA-seq analysis, she really got a nice population of RTN neurons as indicated here by expression of VGLU2. So these are glutamatergic excitatory cells as expected and they all express FOX2B. And uh, moreover, they didn't express any of the markers associated with uh, other nearby cells like C1 adrenergic neurons, RAFE neurons or inhibitory neurons. And um, an interesting result that she obtained was that uh, these cells also express a neuropeptide uh, called neuromedin B. And when she, uh, this uh, peptide had also been uh, suggested to be in these cells um, in this um, earlier paper from the Krasno and Feldman group uh, who um, had implicated the, this uh, neuromedin B in psi production. But what uh, 
what Ying Tang noted was that this um, was uh, expressed in all of these uh, RTN neurons, and also that it's expressed selectively in these RTN neurons in um, this uh, in this region. So this just shows um, some RNA scope. Uh, with neuromedin B in blue here um, in all of these VGLUT2 excitatory cells that also express FOX2B. And this is a mapping of the cells. Uh, and you can see that it aligns almost uh, exactly perfectly with the um, RTN region. And so um, by, um, uh, so we could, we could show then that these, this neuromedin B turned out to be a very good marker uh, a selective marker for the RTN region. So FOX2B, in this Venn diagram, you can see that FOX2B labels uh, additional cells aside from RTN in the uh, parafacial region, uh, but the NMB and VGLUT2 are a precise, uh, um, precise markers for the RTN region, uh, RTN neurons themselves. Um, and some subpopulation of these cells express those molecular proton detectors um, and also uh, various um, other interesting um, ion channels and, and neuropeptides. So for the last little bit of the talk, I just want to spend a little time on one of these neuropeptides that we became um, interested in, um, a, a neuropeptide called PACAP. So PACAP, we found, was highly expressed in all um, RTN neurons. So PACAP is, called, is um, short for pituitary adenylate site adenylate cyclase activating peptide. It's encoded by ADCYAP1. And um, it was universally expressed in these neurons. And this is shown here in this RNA scope um, uh, experiment, uh, where you can see that, FOC, uh, that ADCYAP1 you know, is co-expressed with FOX2B and neuromedin B. So this um, uh, PACAP, uh, it acts on three uh, related receptors, but only one of those, a receptor called PAC1, is expressed in the pre-Botzinger complex region down here where um, we, I mentioned the RTN neurons project. And so this is shown here in this in situ hybridization where you can see PAC1 expression around these somatostatin, somatostatinergic uh, neurons in the pre-Botzinger complex. And this was interesting to us uh, for a number of reasons, based on some earlier work by the Wilson and Cummings group, uh, who had found that global PACAP deletion in mice leads to blunted CO2 sensitivity and also a SIDS-like phenotype. And of course, the blunted CO2 sensitivity caught our attention because of the RTN involvement in CO2 regulation. In addition, they noted the PACAP and PAC1 variants are associated with SIDS um, in human infants. And so we asked the question, could the respiratory effects that they noted in these PACAP knockout mice, especially this blunted CO2 sensitivity, uh, could, this, um, account, could this be accounted for by a PACAP expression in the RTN region or PAC1 expression in the, in the pre-Botzinger complex or both? So uh, to answer this question, um, we uh, made uh, conditional knockout mice uh, where we used a, a viral approach to delete um, PACAP from the RTN of, uh, of mice. So we obtained PACAP flox mice uh, here, and then we injected either a control virus uh, where m cherry is expressed downstream of the FOX2B promoter, or um, we injected a virus in which Cree, the Cree recombinase, uh, was injected downstream of uh, a virus containing um, Cree downstream of the PRSX8 promoter was injected into the RTN region of these PACAP flox mice. And so what you can see here is uh, a couple of examples of this uh, experiment. So in the control here, where the virus only expresses m cherry, you see lots of PACAP expression in the, uh, in the virally transduced neurons, uh, indicated by the yellow arrows, the expressing both red and green. Um, and, um, but in the m cherry, uh, Cree m cherry uh, virally uh, transduced neurons, you can see that those yellow uh, arrows are pointing to uh, trans virally transduced cells, and those virally transduced cells don't uh, have any uh, PACAP. So this was, um, uh, the viral um, transduction was very speci specific for RTN neurons, um, and uh, about 95%. 
And we uh, generally got about 65 to 70 percent of the neurons uh, transduced um, in this uh, with this approach. And so what about the effect on breathing? So here you can see that um, in the mice that were um, injected with the control vi virus, there, the CO2 um, uh, stimulated breathing was unaffected. But in the animals that got the Cree virus, you can see a strong uh, decrease in CO2 uh, stimulated breathing. And interestingly, also um, in the animals that got the Cree virus, we had a huge increase in the number of apneas, that is the periods when the animals just stop breathing altogether. So we could re uh, replicate this um, using a different approach, a, virally, um, uh, a viral um, expression of an shRNA to knock down PACAP in the RTN of wild type mice. And we could um, rescue the deficits associated with this um, uh, with conditional PACAP knockout mice by re-expressing uh, PACAP in those in those mice. And finally, uh, when we looked at the RTN neuron chemosensitivity, either in vitro or in vivo, it was unaffected by PACAP depletion. So the RTN neuron chemosensitivity seemed to be intact, which suggests that maybe uh, the PACAP was working um, on uh, downstream targets, for example, by its receptor in the uh, pre botzinger complex. So in order to examine this, we generated another, um, uh, another viral construct, and in this case, uh, to knock down um, receptors in, in the pre botzinger complex. So here we injected, um, uh, we used a, a nonspecific EF1 uh, alpha promoter uh, to drive uh, a reporter gene, M. cherry, uh, in pre botzinger neurons, and then uh, Paul, 3, uh, Paul 3 promoter H1 uh, to drive an shRNA to induce knockdown of PAC1. And so by comparison to the control condition, where you can see lots of PAC1 expression, even in the virally transduced M. cherry expressing cells here, um, in the after uh, transduction with the PAC1 shRNA to knock down PAC1, you see that those virally transduced cells have very little expression of PAC1. So it looks like the experimental situation is appropriate for testing this. And when we, um, Microinjected PACAP into this region to see the respiratory effects. We noted that the PAC1 knockdown completely blocked the respiratory effects of this uh, microinjected PACAP. So functionally, uh, the uh, receptor knockdown was effective. And so, what about effects on breathing? So we could uh, again do our experiments with um, uh, raising uh, CO2 and testing effects on ventilation. And what you can see is that after PAC1 knockdown, you have a nice uh, decrease in the uh, respiratory uh, effects of CO2. And we also, um, after knockdown of PAC1 in the pre-Botzinger complex, got a major increase in the numbers of apneas. So it appears that uh, PAC1 depletion in the pre Botzinger complex uh, recapitulated the effects of PAC app de depletion in the um, RTN. So this suggests a, a neural circuit um, by which, um, according to which, PAC app expression in the RTN acts downstream on a PAC1 receptor in the pre Botzinger complex to convey, at least in part, the CO2. Uh, st uh, stimulated breathing and also um, general drive to breathing, as indicated by this, um, these effects on apneas. So um, when I when I first started uh, to tell you about this PACAP story, I mentioned that um, the work of Wilson and Cummings had indicated a role potentially in sudden infant death. And so we were quite interested um, to observe that there was a strong increase in PACAP expression uh, right around the time of birth. So um, in comparison to the prenatal period here, there's a major increase in a PACAP expression um, here shown by RNA scope uh, in situ hybridization in these uh, RTN neurons uh, indicated by NMB expression. And this occurred almost immediately after birth and then sort of tapered away. And we, um, we examined this in a separate um, set of experiments by single cell uh, QRT-PCR, where we picked individual RTN neurons uh, throughout this, uh, these different time periods 
And I think it's pretty clear from these data that there was a big jump in PACAP expression uh, right around the time of birth as, as the mouse transitioned from embryonic to postnatal period, and then it sort of slowly tapered away. And this is captured here also in this cumulative uh, probability distributions where the red is the embryonic period and then the blue is this early uh, postnatal period where there's a strong uh, shift to higher uh, levels of PACAP expression immediately after birth. So uh, when we uh, looked for um, in these RTN neurons at changes in other genes, we didn't see this postnatal uh, um, uh, per period of, of increased expression, for example, FOX2B, BGLU2, or NMB. And we also didn't see any change in PACAP expression um, in other uh, nearby neurons, um, uh, in particular, C1 adrenergic or NTS cells. So it looks like this, uh, this early postnatal expression pattern was selective for um, RTN neurons and selective for PACAP within those RTN neurons. So um, this um, made us uh, wonder whether this is just a well-timed expression pattern or whether it has something to do actually with, with birth um, and the initiation of breathing. Um, and so we designed some experiments to test this um, by um, inducing birth at different times. Um, and so this is the, the procedure we use. So we, with some time pregnant uh, female mice, uh, we could inject mifepristone, also known as RU46, as an anti-progestin, and it can induce uh, preterm birth uh, around the time uh, that, you, that you wish. And so we did it at embryonic day 17.5, 18.5, and 19.5. And then we looked for changes in PACAP expression around the time of birth. And so what you can see here, and this is an example from an E17.5 animal that was um, where, where, we, um, where we induced the preterm birth, that um, at birth, even though it was only E17.5, there was an increase in, in PACAP expression. And interestingly, this was not seen if we got the mice uh, before they had um, been uh, emerged from their amniotic sac, that is before they um, had started breathing on their own, that increase in uh, PACAP expression was not seen. And so this was, uh, we observed this at, at these different uh, time points. So at E17.5, you see an increase in PACAP expression in the mice that had emerged from the sac and started breathing on their own, but not in those uh, that were still uh, taken, um, still in the, um, in the sac. Um, and this is, uh, these data are um, obtained by single cell uh, PCR. And this was true at E18.5 um, and also E19.5, you can see that the um, backup expression um, is also observed. So it seems like uh, it, it can be induced uh, at the time of birth and involves also emergent, the animal emerging from the um, amniotic sac. And um, we could also look at this over uh, a time course immediately after birth and ask when uh, PACAP started uh, to be expressed. And you can see that even as early as five minutes or 15 minutes, and then even more so uh, at, at somewhat later times, that, there's, um, that the PACAP is uh, turned on almost immediately. And by single cell qPCR, you can see that within 30 to 60 minutes after birth, uh, these animals um, are um, expressing PACAP at much higher levels in the, um, in the RTN. So it appears that PACAP um, upregulation is stimulated at birth and also by exposure to the ambient environment um, and uh, precisely around the time the animals um, start to breathe on their own. So does this PACAP expression in these early neonates uh, have any effect on their uh, breathing. So this is the final set of experiments I'll show you. Um, so what we find is that um, uh, by using some conditional knockout mice, that um, PACAP actually is important for breathing. So this, is, this experiment was done by crossing FOX2B creep mice with those PACAP FLOX mice in order to generate um, knockout of PACAP uh, precisely in FOX2B expressing uh, neurons. And then we could ex uh, examine their breathing responses by using a plethysmograph for, for neonatal uh, mice. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, <clears throat> this shows um, 
the effect of CO2 on breathing in these in these mice. And so here's the control uh, mice, the packet flocks mice exposed to CO2. You see a, a nice increase in breathing, and this <coughs> increase in breathing is blunted in the case of the conditional knockout mice where PACAP was eliminated from FOX2B expressing neurons. So this is about a 50% reduction in CO2 sensitivity. We also found, um, as we had seen in, in the adults um, with uh, RTN specific knockdown of, of PACAP, uh, here in these neonates, we also see an increase in apneas. So about a doubling or threefold increase in apneas. And, um, Interestingly, um, <clears throat> since uh, one of the uh, one of the things that's uh, one of the challenges, the physiological challenges that's associated with SIDS is uh, thermal challenges. So if a baby gets uh, too hot or too cold, um, they can have an increase in um, in apneas. Uh, so what we see here in these mice is that the apneas. Um, are exacerbated by a thermal challenge, even more so in the PACAP knockout mice. So here are the control mice, you see an increase in apneas with either cooling or warming. And in the knockout mice, uh, that increase is exacerbated. So um, in conclusion, um, I hope I've been able to show you that RTN neurons um, are important for driving respiratory output and CO2 stimulated breathing. We think that they possess a number of unique properties uh, that are important for uh, regulating their tonic firing and pacemaker activity, and uh, importantly for their CO2 regulation, including redundant mechanisms for uh, CO2 or proton sensitive uh, drive uh, to breathe. And that there's a neuropeptidergic supplementary drive activated at birth by this neuropeptide called PACAP. And we think this is important for um, regulating breathing at a particularly vulnerable time uh, for the, for the um, animal. Uh, RTN neurons are uniquely eliminated in a mouse model of CCHS. And we think that, that loss of RTN um, neurons likely accounts for some of the uh, effects in CCHS patients, um, <clears throat> particularly the blunted uh, central respiratory chemoreflex that's seen in those patients. Uh, but it's, I think it's important to also note that it's likely that uh, FOX2B mutations uh, cause other defects in uh, CCHS patients aside from this RTN uh, hypoplasia. So for example, uh, when our colleagues did their, uh, their um, uh, chemotoxic RTN ablation in rats, uh, they did not see the profound hypoventilation and, and apneas that are typically seen during sleep with um, in CCHS patients. So this suggests that there must be other, uh, other defects. Uh, I think um, some important future considerations um, along the lines of the, of the work that we've described here is to, uh, is to know whether uh, there's actually um, a human RTN that's defective in CCHS, and perhaps that could be best studied by using uh, neuromedin B as a marker for those RTN neurons, since we've seen here, at least in mice and rats, that it's a pretty selective marker for RTN neurons. And um, as mentioned, other, uh, other cell groups are likely involved in the overall CCHS um, syndrome. And so, uh, we're interested in what contributions there are from other FOX2B expressing cell groups and what genes is FOX2B uh, regulating in those other cell groups. So FOX2B, uh, as I noted earlier, is a transcription factor that's important for regulating gene expression. And we don't know what genes are being regulated by FOX2B uh, in, these, um, in these various neurons in the brainstem. And finally, we wonder also if some of these uh, specific genes, for example, GPR4 and TAS2, uh, <clears throat> could contribute to other um, central hypoventilation syndromes like SIDS, as mentioned uh, through the talk, and maybe even in, in presentations of patients uh, that are CCHS-like, but in which the patients don't have a FOX2B mutation, uh, which is um, diagnostic for CCHS itself. So those are a few of the things that we're thinking of, of now. So I just want to end by acknowledging the people who did the work um, that I've described here. So um, in our lab, uh, Dan Mulkey, um, 
started off this work um, in that in a collaboration with uh, the DNA lab uh, for that Nature Neuroscience paper identifying RTN neurons as central chemoreceptors. Uh, Wang Sheng was uh, responsible for our work on uh, TAS2 in RTN neurons. Tash Kumar um, was uh, responsible for the experiments that we did um, identifying GPR4 as a CO2 sen uh, proton sensor in RTN neurons. Kiyang um, did the experiments on um, RTN intrinsic properties, especially the TRIP-M4 study. And Ying Tang Shi, whoops, uh, Ying Tang Shi was responsible for the single cell transcriptomics and um, the very nice work on, on PACAP. Uh, I mentioned uh, throughout that we have um, had a long-term collaboration with Patrice ENA and also Ruth Stornetta in his lab. We also have had some uh, help with uh, generating viruses by Ed Perez Reyes at the University of Virginia. And we've um, also been lucky enough to have a number of outside collaborators. So Jacques and Christian um, on our task two work, Karsten Wagner at University of Zurich and Klaus Suen and Marie Ludwig at Novartis uh, for our work on uh, the, the GPR4 uh, story. And Rachel Ross and Brad Lowell provided us with the pack app Flox Mice and Greg Funk's lab together with uh, these students um, helped out with some of the pack app recordings uh, in vitro, which I didn't have time to talk about. And um, of course, we want to thank our funding agencies, um, in particular, the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and also um, the support that we've received from the CCHS family network uh, throughout. Uh, thank you uh, for your interest and attention.